The following presentation was recorded by VIEW Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Well, great. Thanks so much for coming out and uh, especially for coming while you're at a tech conference to hear a lawyer talk about copyright law. Uh, but I think it's critically important to uh, get the lawyers and the technologists talking because left to their own devices, the lawyers are making a pretty bad mess of uh, copyright law. And, uh, and here we're a decade into the digital millennium as proclaimed by Congress in announcing the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And uh, my concern is that the DMCA is undermining the architecture of collaboration, the internet and uh, open source programming have given us terrific tools for uh, developing technology uh, to improve our sharing of creative expression and copyright law is built to prop up these old structures and uh, not really helping us uh, the ways that it could be. So um, a little bit of the legal policy justifications. Uh, this was uh, the white paper of the uh, Working Group on Intellectual Property Rights 1995 as they were first looking at this thing, the internet, and wondering uh, what is it and what do we do with it? The full potential of the national information infrastructure, uh, as they called it at the time, uh, won't be realized uh, if education, information, and entertainment products protected by intellectual property laws uh, are not protected effectively when disseminated by, via the NII. Uh, and the, the, though the architects of this vision of internet saw intellectual property rights as the key to uh, establishing internet communications. All the computers, telephones, fax machines, etc., cetera, uh, wires, cables, networks, and satellites in the world will not create a successful NII if there is no content. What will drive the NII is the content moving through it. Uh, and so armed with that vision uh, of what internet was, uh, they set up structures to protect the content they recognized, and the content they recognized, uh, as the lobbyists from the big movie studios and music companies were telling them, uh, was the big mass-produced, big-budget content, and uh, the laws reflect that. Um, and so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 uh, has two key sections that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about. Uh, Section 512 is the uh, Internet Service Provider Safe Harbor, uh, a regime that sets up a safe harbor for ISPs, uh, and also a notice and takedown for uh, service providers notified of material claim to infringe uh, copyright. Uh, this is a treating the ISPs as pressure points where uh, material communications can be blocked. Uh, the other big piece is uh, Section 1201, uh, the anti-circumvention provisions, uh, establishing technical protection measures and legal protections for those uh, technical locks. Around the same time, Congress added another 20 years to copyright terms with the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. Um, 20 years to all existing and future uh, copyrights. So uh, software produced by a company today lasts uh, as work for hire, lasts for 95 years uh, under copyright. The uh, works of individual authorship last for the life of the author uh, plus 70 years, uh, a long time during which we need to ask for permission or uh, navigate the shoals of fair use uh, to use copyrighted material. Uh, so why does all of this matter to uh, us as computer programmers and users uh, and technology developers and independent creators? Uh, because uh, it comes into conflict with uh, the internet as the national information infrastructure uh, that NII becomes the internet. And, 
And we see all of the, the technological change that powers uh, internet development um, and uh, a bit of a collision here. So Moore's law tells us that processing power, uh, uh, originally the number of transist transistors uh, on a chip doubles about every 18 months. Computers are getting faster. The tools that we have on our desktops and uh, in our companies are getting faster, giving us more and more power to uh, develop uh, more and more powerful software and tools to share uh, with one another. Uh, Metcalfe's law tells us that uh, the power of a network grows with the square of the number of people connected to it because each of us can communicate with every other person uh, on the network if we want to, and that uh, produces uh, an exponentially gro growing number of connections. Some of those connections may not be useful to us, but some of them will be, and uh, as Clay Shirky suggests, we can find latent groups uh, in the uh, technology as it becomes easier to connect, uh, we need uh, to do less uh, to get there. We can connect via a shared hashtag on a uh, Twitter or Identica. We can connect via uh, around a photograph that one of us has posted on a weblog. We can find one another through uh, open source projects, and it's easy to throw something out there and see what kind of community assembles around it. Uh, so these links are uh, incredibly important. Uh, and Wikimedia Commons shows us some of the, uh, both as, operates as a great source of graphics to illustrate this, uh, and shows the power of, who would have thought 10 years ago, certainly the NII white paper drafters wouldn't have thought that you could throw up an encyclopedia anyone could edit and would actually get something useful out of it, uh, but because it was possible to try, uh, it became possible to do. Uh, and uh, so we see just a, a plethora of services. Some of these things may uh, have gone down. Some of them uh, have achieved tremendous power, um, and uh, more of them are uh, able to be tried every day. Uh, we've got the disruptive technologies, the power of uh, new technologies and little guys to come up and change the way an industry works. Uh, and so uh, TiVo, with its uh, Linux-powered uh, operating system inside changes the way we experience broadcast television um, uh, and uh, didn't need to ask permission from the broadcasters uh, in order to, to launch that technology, um, was able to, to build its product up before uh, challenging and then uh, coming into negotiations with some of them. Uh, none of these guys needed to ask permission uh, because they were building uh, around uh, materials that were, while copyrighted, uh, making uh, lawful, non-infringing uses uh, of lots of those materials. So they were taking advantage of uh, the Betamax uh, rule, uh, where the Supreme Court said years ago that a technology capable of substantial non-infringing uses uh, wouldn't be uh, deemed to uh, contribute to infringement of copyright, even if some people were uh, taping movies and uh, in ways that the movie studios didn't want. That uh, exception uh, has led to uh, this range of devices, some of them open source, some of them not, uh, but the opportunity for uh, developers to come in and uh, work with uh, these things and uh, to offer the open source alternatives. Uh, so uh, I said the links are, are threatened. The links of communication uh, are threatened by the uh, pressure on internet service providers to police copyrights on behalf of major copyright owners. So the uh, number of uh, DMCA takedowns uh, is on the rise. This is a uh, chart of just some of the complaints that Google receives uh, cl demanding that it remove material that has been posted to its blogger blogs or uh, even is linked from the Google search engine. Uh, people claim to Google that by providing a link to a 
page that infringes their copyright, uh, that Google might be contributing to the infringement when someone goes and visits that infringing page and thereby makes a reproduction in their computer of the copyrighted material. Uh, well, since the DMCA safe harbor says that uh, a service provider won't be held liable for uh, its users' copyright infringement, if the service provider responds expeditiously to a notice of claimed infringement by removing the material, uh, Google and most other hosting companies and search engines respond to those notices by uh, removing uh, the complaint of material. Uh, so a particularly uh, notable instance uh, of that takedown uh, was during the, the recent presidential campaign uh, season uh, when uh, candidate McCain had posted to his YouTube channel um, a series of his campaign commercials and uh, videos that they had made. Some of the things that he included in those videos were his television appearances. Candidate goes on an interview and uh, says something that he wants to highlight to his supporters. Uh, he takes a clip from the, the television program and includes it in that uh, video here. Uh, well, several uh, television stations, and, uh, including the Christian Broadcasting Network uh, and, and Fox, I believe, uh, sent DMCA takedown notices to YouTube claiming this is an infringement of our copyright. He has copied from our copyrighted television program. He, along with uh, dozens of other people, uh, please remove these clips. And uh, YouTube, following its standard DMCA notice and takedown procedure, removed the clips, removed the uh, campaign videos. And uh, this didn't make the McCain campaign too happy, so uh, they sent a letter along to YouTube uh, saying, uh, we want to alert you to a problem that's chilled this free and uninhibited discourse. They were appreciating the, the power of the internet to communicate with uh, followers in a democratic uh, discussion, or a Republican discussion, if you will, and, and uh, protested uh, that uh, we need to prevent meritless copyright claims from chilling political speech, uh, asking YouTube to please change this rule, at least for us, uh, because while the DMCA allows the recipient of a takedown or the target of a takedown to file a counter notification and demand uh, request that the material be put back up, that uh, the, the service provider is only able to honor that after waiting 10 to 14 business days. So YouTube could have put this video back up 10 to 14 business days later uh, and remained free of copyright claims. 10 to 14 business days in the middle of a political campaign, not something the McCain-Palin team wanted to wait. Um, so they asked for an exception, and YouTube's response was, thank you very much for your concern, but no. We've got to treat everybody equally. Um, you can avail yourselves of the law, uh, if you like, um, and you can file a 512F complaint for abuse of the DMCA uh, takedown process. And uh, we also note that you have a little bit of political power to change these things that the rest of us don't. Uh, we hope that as a content uploader, you've gained a sense of some of the challenges we face every day in operating YouTube. And we look forward to working with Senator or President McCain on ways to combat abuse of the DMCA process in the future. Uh, so uh, I haven't seen Senator McCain propose the DMCA Abusive uh, Takedown Prevention Act yet, but uh, we can all suggest to his office that uh, now that the campaign has wound down and he's got time to focus on uh, governing again, uh, maybe he should look to this. Um, so um, I don't want to pick on Google here because they're also doing uh, good things like uh, helping the public at least to see the way the law is operating. Um, they're offering some transparency to this notice and takedown process uh, by 
rather than silently removing links, they are showing uh, us where links have been removed and uh, letting you click through to a page on chilling effects where these complaints uh, are documented. So uh, there was a time when if you searched for Scientology on the xenu.net uh, critical uh, web page, you'd see a whole bunch of pages had been removed. Uh, but if you wish, you may read the DMCA complaint uh, for these removed results. Um, and uh, clicking over to chilling effects shows you the complaint that has been sent to Google. And uh, because the DMCA requires that you identify with specificity the content you want uh, to have removed, these complaints also contain the URLs to the uh, pages being complained about. Uh, and while they're not hyperlinks, all of you know how to use copy and paste and uh, can help to see whether the law is operating as intended. Are these pages that are being removed rip-offs of somebody else's copyrighted material? Uh, or are they pages that are critical uh, commentary that use some quotations from somebody else's copyrighted work in order to, uh, to discuss it, the sort of thing that would be recognized by the copyright law uh, and by a judge as fair use if it got to that point. Problem is, when you put the squeeze on the ISP, very few of these cases get before a judge uh, because most people don't fight it. Uh, most ISPs don't uh, fight it. Many people are uncertain about their options. Uh, and so the Chilling Effects Project aims to help people to understand what's happening, uh, help people to understand their options if they get one of these takedowns, uh, and offers some resources uh, even to help people file uh, counter notifications if they, uh, if they need to. Um, other projects in the transparency game uh, include MIT's UTOOM project. This is a project of the MIT Free Culture Group. Uh, tracking takedowns from YouTube, um, watching uh, what goes missing out of the uh, popular videos on YouTube, and uh, helping the public to see what's happening. Where are uh, the automated content filters taking down something that might uh, or might not be infringing? Where is uh, speech being restricted? Uh, and uh, as well, where are people just blatantly infringing copyright? Uh, because it's certainly not the case that every one of these takedowns uh, is abusive. Uh, so um, another place where um, very recently um, internet service providers and uh, copyright takedowns uh, are in the news. Uh, Across the ocean in France, the French legislature uh, approved the Hadopi uh, Three Strikes and You're Out, or Graduated Response uh, Law, requiring internet service providers to listen to complaints from uh, an administrative agency, basically populated by the copyright industries, uh, to say, if you get three complaints against uh, an internet user, uh, that user's uh, internet subscription must be shut off, and the user has to continue paying internet service fees and can't sign up to get internet service through another provider. Um, so three strikes uh, of claimed copyright infringement, uh, and you're cut off the French internet. Uh, well, just on Wednesday, the French constitutional court said, not so fast, uh, internet access is key to exercising sort of basic human rights. You know, the court read the uh, French Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen to say, uh, free communication of thoughts and opinions is one of the most precious rights. Uh, and uh, the use uh, of the internet to engage in that free communication uh, is so important that people can't be cut off without true judicial process. Uh, none of this administrative agency saying uh, no internet access for you. Uh, so uh, European Union uh, had been raising similar concerns in criticism of the French law. Uh, so we're starting to see more pushback against this uh, 
thinking that property rules and uh, anyone who is even a suspected infringer uh, might be cut off. Um, so from the links of communication uh, to uh, the locks of uh, anti-circumvention, the other uh, key piece of the DMCA um, as affecting uh, free software and communication uh, is the anti-circumvention law, which says uh, if you put a uh, digital lock uh, on a copyrighted work, uh, it's an independent violation of the law to circumvent that lock, uh, to break the technological measures uh, claimed to protect copyright. Uh, well, this is uh, important because um, not only does it apply to media, music, and movies covered by uh, DRM, it applies to uh, software programs which are uh, copyrighted works and uh, can be protected by technological measures. Um, it might apply to the firmware running inside your phone. Uh, if you want to unlock your phone to run it on a different network or to uh, jailbreak it to run your own programs on it, um, Apple claims that that is a circumvention of its technological protection measures protecting the software that runs uh, the phone and that they should have the right to uh, stop you from, uh, from doing that, from switching it to a different network or uh, running your own uh, programming on it. Um, and uh, so you may um, remember the earliest of the litigations around uh, DMCA anti-circumvention rules uh, came when uh, 2600 Magazine, along with some others, uh, posted the uh, DCSS code that was uh, able to decrypt the content scramble system on DVDs. And uh, D uh, 2600 uh, and Emmanuel Goldstein were sued for uh, trafficking in circumvention tools uh, and forced to remove not only their posting of the code, but even the links uh, to the code, uh, because that might facilitate people's acquiring these uh, illegal circumvention tools, uh, as the court ruled. Uh, well, what does that do to circumvention tools like this? Uh, researchers found that when uh, so-called copy-protected CDs came out, some of them could be uh, disabled by writing with a marker around the edge of the disk. And that would block them from auto running in your Windows machine if that, uh, and installing secretly some uh, DRN enforcement software. So now do we have to ban the sale of Sharpies? Uh, they haven't gone quite that far, uh, but uh, others have tried to use uh, DMCA to uh, enforce uh, against interoperability. Uh, Lexmark claimed that because its printer toner cartridges had a little loader program inside, that that was a copyrighted work that they were entitled to uh, protect against somebody manufacturing, remanufactured, refilled cartridges. Um, and thankfully, the court has uh, thrown that one out. Um, but not because the law wasn't intended to cover things like this, uh, but because Lexmark hadn't implemented it very cleverly. They had left a way for you to get the program uh, without breaking any encryption, uh, and therefore the, uh, the uh, lockout code that they had was deemed not an effective uh, technological measure uh, because they'd left the back door open. Um, so this is a... And here's where I want to come to the uh, little movie that I was trying to uh, cue up earlier. Uh, so every three years, um, the anti-circumvention law has a uh, rulemaking procedure built into it, where uh, you can uh, petition the uh, Library of Congress and Copyright Office uh, to uh, exempt certain uh, circumventions from the law because uh, you say it's necessary in order to allow for 
non-infringing uses. It's not that we're trying to infringe copyright here. Uh, we're just trying to make fair use of clips of movies or uh, lawfully run programs on the phone devices that we've purchased uh, or test the security of computer programs and software that we've purchased uh, without fearing that we would be uh, deemed to circumvent the, the copyright law. Um, and so a few months ago, the uh, Copyright Office held hearings uh, in this rulemaking procedure. One of the uh, petitions for exemption came from uh, a wide group of filmmakers and media educators and uh, library groups, all of whom were arguing that there are plenty of cases where copying something from a DVD is not an infringement of copyright. If I'm a media educator and I want to queue up a string of film clips to show in class to uh, demonstrate how character is developed across a range of filmmaking techniques, that's not an infringement of the copyright of any of those movies. Uh, but DCSS, the copy protection on DVDs, forbids me from doing that unless I stack up a whole bunch of DVDs put them one by one into the player, fast forward to the right place, and in each one, technically, it would be possible to pull clips from the DVD to a hard drive and show them uh, in series, but the movie studios and industry says that's a circumvention of technical measures. Uh, so a whole bunch of these uh, film educators and uh, lawyers and librarians and uh, teachers and documentary filmmakers came to Congress, uh, to the Library of Congress, to explain why it was critical that they be able to have uh, high quality movies and movie clips to demonstrate. Uh, and then the, the MPAA uh, representative uh, offered this in response um, No, you don't need to. Uh, circumvent the copy protection. You don't need to break CSS because you can set up a video recorder pointed at your flat screen television and capture the video that way. Uh, and so we were treated, those of us sitting in the Library of Congress, uh, were treated to this demonstration of how to videotape a movie. whose sound still doesn't seem to work. Uh, but anyhow, so this is, so you set up your video camera and uh, you uh, then make sure that the screen is properly framed, uh, connect up all the pieces together, uh, and um, at the end of the day and several thousand dollars later, you might have a copy of a movie that is almost as good but uh, discernibly different from what you'd get if you just uh, used a little piece of software uh, on your computer to uh, decrypt that very weak copy protection scheme. Uh, but this is the movie studios who have fought in states across the country for anti-camcording laws, making it a crime to bring a video camera into a movie theater, uh, demonstrating to all of us that this is their preferred way of making a copy of uh, a, a video from DVD. Uh, and uh, in just a moment, I think it gets to the final picture. Uh, they're trying to open it up now. <laughs> All of this, uh, so Tim Vollmer, uh, who works with the American Library Association, uh, was there at the hearing uh, and made this video uh, showing. Uh, and finally, we get to Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, so at some point um, in the next months, we will hear about that rulemaking and uh, whether the uh, librarian and register of copyrights have uh, given the public any new three-year exemptions. Um, 
And uh, so whether we can unlock our phones or uh, as educators make film clips from movies without uh, uh, falling afoul of uh, anti-circumvention, we still uh, don't have permission to distribute the tools needed to do those uh, acts. So um, it, it's unclear how, the, how useful uh, those exemptions are for us all, uh, even when they do come up. Um, and uh, and these are critical to open source software uh, because by standardizing an encryption scheme, however weak it may be, uh, around copyrighted media, uh, major entertainment companies uh, are essentially able to say, sorry, you can't interoperate with that with free software. Um, you notice that all of the DVD players um, out on the market are either hardware players or proprietary software uh, because the copy protection is built into uh, the, the, the software and it's an anti-consumer feature there. Nobody thinks that uh, the DVD is more valuable because of that you can't record it button. Uh, and so if this were free and open source software, uh, many people would uh, engineer around that restriction, um, comment it out, uh, don't bother checking for it, um, and uh, not because they wanted to infringe copyrights, but simply because they wanted uh, to make full use of the media uh, that they were given uh, or that they purchased. Uh, and so in order to protect this uh, so-called high-value content at the core of uh, uh, this copyright production scheme, uh, they are locking out uh, a whole range of free and open development around it. Um, if you've got a home media system built around free and open source software, um, of course you can find DCSS and you can find updated versions and uh, any search engine knows where to find that and there are all sorts of code packages uh, around it, uh, but um, uh, you can't um, easily and lawfully uh, make use of that. Uh, so when a company like uh, Real Networks wants to offer uh, a, a DVD backup uh, system uh, or a DVD jukebox, uh, they get themselves sued by uh, the, the entertainment companies and they're still fighting uh, over whether uh, these real technologies products uh, violate either the DMCA or the contracts and licensing arrangements that uh, the entertainment companies have set up around uh, uh, around uh, CSS and uh, the, the restrictions that they place on uh, in order to get an authorized license for uh, CSS decryption, uh, you need to agree that your DVD player will not make backup copies, that it will not allow people to change the regions of their players, to watch DVDs purchased from other parts uh, of the world, um, that it won't let people skip over the um, introductory previews at the beginning or the FBI warning, uh, none of which adds to the viewing experience. Um, and uh, so these laws are written without a lot of thought about uh, the scope of the, the technologies and the, the market and the technological possibilities. Whoever was writing uh, DMCA anti-circumvention didn't probably realize that they were cutting off uh, free and open development wouldn't have realized at the time the power and potential uh, of free and open development. And um, it's an uphill battle that goes on in each one of these hearings uh, to remind um, and instruct the, uh, the Copyright Office uh, and Congress about the range of copyright related activities that are happening in places that they're not looking. Uh, so MPAA 
RIAA can hire phalanxes of lobbyists to talk about the high value uh, of their intellectual property and their contributions to trade and uh, everybody can recognize their movies and their music. Uh, Congress also needs to be reminded about uh, the free and open software that is powering uh, the render farms that make some of those movies, the web servers from which <laughs> those things are distributed, um, the operating systems and lots of the, the computers that uh, that make the network work um, and need to be reminded courteously uh, but uh, correctly about uh, this range of sort of unnoticed innovation um, and uh, the ways that uh, these laws are having um, unintended consequences uh, to, of restricting uh, that kind of independent development. Uh, so I'll close here with one uh, sort of victory celebration uh, because uh, as you may know if you uh, watch television over rabbit ears, uh, we have just concluded uh, our delayed digital television transition uh, where we switched from analog to uh, digital broadcasting. Early on when this transition was being proposed, uh, the uh, entertainment companies went to the Federal Communications Commission uh, and said, we won't make our programming available in digital if it's not protected against copying. All of those pirates with their videotapes are going to go high tech and record our beautiful digital broadcasts and we'll have no way to stop it. We're simply going to withhold our programming if you don't give us a broadcast flag. Uh, and the broadcast flag uh, the FCC made a rule, uh, the broadcast flag rule required um, every digital television receiver um, and demodulator, anything capable of recognizing a digital television signal, uh, would have been required to respect and respond to the broadcast flag. So it had to, as it de demodulated and decoded those bits, watch for the flag. If the flag said, don't copy, uh, then uh, it had to refuse to output those bits to an, over an unencrypted interface uh, or to anything in high resolution. Uh, so you could get your encrypted HDMI, but not your uh, high resolution analog or uh, unencrypted digital um, outputs. And uh, this would have been a technological mandate on every manufacturer of technology. Uh, it, when I was at EFF, we asked, would that have applied to uh, software, GNU radio uh, devices capable of demodulating in software? Uh, the FCC uh, seemed puzzled by that question. But they were perfectly willing to mandate for hardware uh, manufactured that it be crippled that it forbid its users from doing things like building uh, an open source DVR. Uh, so I love my Myth TV. My Myth TV has a high definition television capture card and uh, it pulls down that six gigabyte an hour stream of uh, digital broadcast. Um, and I'm not doing it to infringe copyright. I'm doing it because if I want to watch television, I want to do it on my schedule. Uh, but that would have been uh, impossible under the broadcast flag regime. Uh, thankfully, um, American Library Association, Public Knowledge, EFF, um, public interest groups challenged the uh, broadcast flag, challenged the FCC's jurisdiction to issue a broadcast flag, saying the FCC has the jurisdiction to control broadcasts, uh, but not receivers, and uh, not to impose mandates on any manufacturer of uh, receiver technology. And uh, the DC Circuit Court agreed. So now, uh, on digital television transition flag day, uh, any of us who wants to can put up a, a demodulator and capture without a broadcast flag, uh, without uh, technological restriction, uh, the digital broadcasts that are coming over the air. Um, so, uh, so there uh, we've won uh, and 
one possibilities uh, to, to continue developing freely uh, in this area. Uh, and so uh, we don't know what we are. Uh, we're not legislating for one particular vision uh, of innovation. Um, it's that we want to leave room for the unexpected. Who would have thought that uh, cats with funny grammar would become a huge internet phenomenon? Who would have thought that the TiVo, the iPod, the iPhone, the, the Linux uh, server and desktop uh, would have become uh, what they were because uh, we had uh, unrestricted access in lots of places. Uh, we've been able to develop those things. Um, and so uh, my message to, to those of you who are developers, keep developing. Um, those of you who are uh, users, keep on helping us to demonstrate uh, the, value, the range of creativity uh, that's not infringing copyright, but that is uh, engaging with copyrighted material that is developing your own copyrighted material um, and the ways that the law uh, needs to support that uh, through tools like uh, free software licenses and GPL and uh, Creative Commons for uh, non-software works um, and to help us uh, with exhibits in the fight against uh, laws that are restricting our activities uh, in other areas. Uh, so uh, thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, question here. Um, when I purchase a DVD player for my computer, why is it that um, the company that you know, owns the patent and the licensing for the DVD insertion wants to sit there and say, sorry, you can't play your legally purchased DVDs on your Linux? Uh, well, it only makes sense if you think about this sort of interlocking scheme of we've got a technological protection measure around our DVDs, and uh, so we require that nobody anywhere in the chain be able to get access to the unencrypted stream of bits from that DVD. Um, if you put it into a Linux system, um, you might see what was being sent to the video card, and you might take those bits and do something awful with them. Uh, worse even than pointing a video camera at the television. <laughs> yeah, over here. Um, well, the, the questions of would you be infringing copyright and could you get a takedown notice are, of course, different. <laughs> so copyright permits you to quote um, as much as is necessary to make commentary and criticism of uh, somebody else's work. And so if you're engaging in a conversation with somebody else's blog post, and that includes taking some quotes and citing them uh, and explaining what you disagree with or agree with, uh, that's doesn't sound like an infringement of copyright. Uh, if somebody filed a DMCA takedown notice, uh, then that would be an opportunity to invoke Section 512F and uh, file a complaint for misuse of the DMCA takedown process. Hi, I'm Justin Leiter of the Ohio Links Fest. I want to compare side by side free software to proprietary software, but I saw some language on Microsoft.com's section for copyright, which seems to imply that I'm not allowed to do a screenshot of their product, a box mm -hmm. shot of their product, nor am I allowed to name any of their products if I do it in a comparative or disparaging manner. <laughs> so that's what you work around it for fair use somehow. Well, now you're coming into the conflict between uh, copyright and uh, contract and end user license agreements. So in their EULA, they can say all sorts of things that aren't limited by uh, the, the fair use exceptions to copyright. And it's not, uh, 
some people, um, I think it was uh, one of the antivirus vendors uh, got network associates was sued by the state of New York for having overreaching language like that uh, in its end user license agreement. Uh, and I think you'd have a lot of people on your side if you wanted to run those benchmarks and then got a lawsuit from Microsoft uh, claiming infringement uh, or viol breach of contract there. Um, so sometimes people are just doing those things to try to scare uh, users, even if they don't expect to be uh, to file a lawsuit and follow up. Uh, but if you if, if you uh, and that's the sort of thing that EFF is very interested in. So if you've got a uh, a, a technical report that you'd like to do and f feel that you're being stopped by ridiculous licensing terms, uh, send a note to EFF and uh, explain the problem and and see if it makes a, a good test case. So I can have a UL that says, you know, I will take the first four shots. But, <laughs> and we know that's all ridiculous. But is there any sort of penalty for them making such a claim in this licensing? Uh, well, sometimes the, the, the uh, a state attorney general or federal trade commission could go after them for um, unfair consumer practices or. Um, uh, or, or a court could declare that because that is unconscionable, the whole contract should be unenforceable. Uh, yes. Uh, going back to the Lex case you were talking about, uh, what makes a protection method effective or ineffective? How is that defined? Um, it doesn't mean it is strong and resistant to user attack. Uh, it only means has the effect of <laughs> is the definition given in the statute. So if by its nature it has the effect of requiring you to uh, decrypt or get authorization. One more. Is that, is that necessarily compatible with open source? I mean, just for example, what if, um, what if the people who did the DVD, what if they actually released their stuff in open source? What if, that could that simultaneously allow Linux people to use it as well at the same time, circumvention of it would be still illegal. Even if the protection is, you know, crap, it doesn't matter. It still provides legal protection, it's not technical protection. Uh, yes, and so the best example uh, of that is uh, some early versions of uh, Adobe's PDF software uh, had some technical controls, but they didn't do anything to enforce that. And if you uh, took XPDF, you could uh, decrypt their uh, so-called do not print PDFs. Um, but so it's the combination of law and licensing that the movie studios say, if you want a license to uh, decrypt CSS, uh, you need to implement it robustly. Uh, and robustness against user modification includes something that can't be decompiled or changed with a jumper or a few comments in source code. Um, and so they've said essentially that uh, they don't believe that any open source implementation would be compatible with their license. But legally, you could release an open source DRM without losing your Yes, um, I, I haven't seen it, but it, uh, it, it could happen. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but I'm being told that I need to, uh, to stop for now. Thanks a lot. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, share alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.